Oytan Nahalo, author of a new book on the Soviet Union. How long has there been a nationalities problem in the Soviet Union? Ever since the beginning of the Soviet state, which is, as you know, 1917 or 1922, when the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the Soviet Union, was formally created. Though, strictly speaking, this problem existed already uh, under the Tsars in the former Russian Empire. Hello, we're very pleased to have with us Mr. Boydan Nahalo. He's an author of a new book called Soviet Disunion, a history of the nationalities problem in the USSR. If you have a question or a comment for our guest, now is the time to call. If you're watching us in the Eastern or Central time zones, you can reach C-SPAN by calling 202-628-2525. If you're watching us in the Western time zones, including the Mountain time zone, 202-783-2727. And we do have our international lines open as well. The number's on your screen if you'd like to uh, call us from outside the United States. Um, first of all, you have written uh, a fascinating book, uh, an exhaustive study of uh, the nationalities problem in the Soviet Union. When you look at the issues facing Mr. Gorbachev today in the Soviet Union, what is the connection between the historical nationalities problem and what's going on right now? It's the same problem simply that this problem was su suppressed for so long. Uh, there was no glasnost, there was no public discussion of the problem. Anybody who tried to raise the issues, the issues of national rights, the rights of the non-Russian republics, was uh, locked away in mental hospitals or in prisons, labor camps. And it's only since Gorbachev uh, relaxed censorship that all these pent-up frustrations, grievances, and aspirations have come to the surface again. When you say uh, Soviet disunion, as uh, your book suggests. You, s you talk a lot in this book about the difference between Russia and the Soviet Union. What is the difference? Well, the difference is that they're not the same. Uh, Russia is the largest nation out of about uh, 100 different nationalities that make up the population of the Soviet Union. Uh, there are 15 large groups that have their own union republics, states, sovereign states on paper, in fact. And the crucial thing to remember is that of the 285 million people that inhabit the Soviet Union, 140 million plus are non-Russians. Uh, are non-Russians, uh, so that the Russians themselves, strictly speaking, make up barely half of the population of the Soviet Union. And a Russian uh, has very little in common with, say, a Turkic-speaking, traditionally Islamic uh, or Muslim Uzbek, for example, or, for example, an Estonian or a Latvian or, for example, a, uh, a member of one of the uh, far northern Eskimo peoples uh, that inhabit the Soviet Union. It's a very vast country, one-sixth of the world's landmass, and uh, what is forgotten uh, in the West is that it is the last of the great empires. M I think many Americans may have heard of the names of many of the different nationalities within the borders of the Soviet Union, but the cultural differences are quite uh, stark, as you point out in your book. Can you share a few uh, examples for us of the cultural uh, rainbow and, the, and some of the differences? Well, the core of the Soviet population is made up of three Slavic peoples, the Russians, the largest group, as I've said, who have been the dominant group. Their language, culture, and values have been forcibly imposed on the others. The Ukrainians, the largest of the non-Russian groups, about mil 52 million in their republic, that's a lot of people. Uh, they are the second largest group of Slavic people, but with their own separate history, with their own uh, aspirations to lead an independent life. The Belarusians, another Slavic people. And then in the Baltic republics, you have the Estonians, Lithuanians, and Latvians who enjoyed a period of independent statehood in the interwar period. Down in the south, uh, in the Transcaucasus, you have the Georgians and the Armenians, two Christian nations whose history predates that of the Russians by many centuries. Uh, you have about 50 million Muslim peoples, traditionally Muslim peoples, Turkic speaking for the most part, Uzbeks, Tajiks, uh, Tajiks are not uh, Turkic speaking, uh, they speak a form of Persian, but Kyrgyz, uh, Azeris, and many others. And apart from those, you have uh, a great number of smaller peoples who have been, in effect, colonized by uh, Russian expansion over the centuries. Do these groups look at perestroika in much the same way? Do they see it 
as an opportunity for them to exert uh, greater freedom? Inevitably, uh, one of the first uh, reactions to Glasnost was to try and take it at face value uh, by the non-Russians. The non-Russians immediately started pressing for the restoration of their rights. Now, this is something that we saw in a more modest form already after Stalin's death, even under Beria, when he made a, uh, the secret police chief who made a play for power in 1953, even then the national question surfaced briefly. Certainly Khrushchev, for a very brief period between 1956 and 1958, when he tried to distance himself from the Stalinist uh, heritage, he too loosened controls in the national sphere, and these sorts of problems began to emerge. But by the end of the 50s, controls were tightened and the emphasis was placed on integration, Russification, that is the imposition of the Russian language, uh, theoretically or ostensibly for internationalist reasons, uh, in the sense that every uh, truly progressive person wanted to speak Russian, and because uh, for a cogent uh, practical reason that Russian was uh, described as the lingua franca of this multinational entity. But of course this was done at the expense of the non-Russian schools, of the non-Russian cultures. And what we have to remember is that this uh, empire was built on the promise that this would be a new model type of society, a socialist society, which would bring equality of all the peoples and races, and that there would be no discrimination and certainly no one dominant uh, nation. And in practice what happened is that uh, almost immediately, and Lenin even recognized this on his deathbed, that the Russian uh, group, the, the dominant force, began to dominate, began to impose their own values, their own culture, their own way of looking at the world, and uh, in effect loyalty to the Soviet state became uh, equated with loyalty to the Russian imperial idea. In case you've just joined us, we're visiting with Boytan Nahalo, who is an author of a new book on the Soviet Union called Soviet Disunion, A History of the Nationalities Problem in the USSR. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, our telephone lines are open and the numbers are on the screen. Um, I'm curious to know how, in your opinion, the Soviet Union or this empire that you've been describing has held together with all these divergent groups. Well, it's held together first and foremost because it was welded together by force. Let us remember that between <coughs> 1917 and 1921, the Bolsheviks actually used force and conquest to weld together what had become a fragmented empire, the empire of the Tsars. And then Lenin realized that force alone was not enough to hold this vast territory together. And so all sorts of promises were made and concessions. And in fact, uh, a, the non-Russians were offered, in effect, a deal which recognized their rights uh, in the Soviet constitution. They were guaranteed, in effect, the right to have their own sovereign states within a f Soviet federal structure. This, for the time being, was enough to more or less placate the non-Russian communist elites because the, no, the non-communist elites were wiped out in the 20s. And so for a time, the system functioned more or less uh, fairly smoothly and the non-Russians even in the 1920s made quite a lot of headway in consolidating their positions as national groups. But by the end of the 1920s, Stalin drastically uh, shifted policy. That was the period of collectivization, the beginning of the purges. and one of the ways in which he shifted policy was to crush the non-Russian elites and to more or less uh, begin backing the Russian-minded, uh, the more chauvinistic bureaucracy uh, that became the backbone of, of the Soviet uh, state. By the end of the war, uh, when there was a hope that perhaps after the victory over fascism, Stalin would relax things and that the worst was behind the Soviet population, the purges and the, the bloodshedding. In fact, he stepped up the pressure on the non-Russians, uh, the famous campaigns against the Jews in 1946-47, the uh, campaigns against Ukrainian nationalism and whatnot, so that by the time of his death in 1953, the non-Russians had been reduced to a very sorry state. They had the formal trappings of statehood, but it, all this was reduced to a kind of recognition of their uh, folksiness, uh, a quaint regionalism, but certainly there was no political clout left uh, in their hands. St. Louis, Missouri, you're the first phone call. Go right ahead with your question or comment. Yes, I wanted to ask your guest this. Uh, uh, I have just 
been in the Soviet Union and toured a number of cities there, uh, one of which was Tashkent, uh, the capital of Uzbekistan. And I talked to the uh, uh, some members of the faculty at the law school there, including the dean, and I was rather disturbed uh, by their uh, recent conversion to their native language and uh, uh, backing away from the Russian language, and I suggested to them in conversation that I thought maybe this was uh, not a very good idea. Uh, secondly, uh, I found a rather alarming uh, ignorance, I would say, of sort of basic economic principles there, and I wonder if your guest uh, would care to comment on that. Well, certainly uh, I'd like to comment. I, with all due respect, I think that's a very condescending view of the Uzbeks. This is a very large nation, the third largest group, and uh, it's not, I think, for us to say that uh, their traditional lifestyle is somehow obsolete or not in keeping with the needs of the Uzbek people. I think that we certainly wouldn't apply this kind of standard to the blacks in South Africa, for example. Um, I, I find it very hard to accept that you, you think that it's somehow disturbing, as you said, that an Uzbek would want to speak his own language. This is a, a basic right. And uh, if they've had Russian imposed on them for, for decades, uh, surely the natural thing is to allow those who want to learn Russian to keep learning it and to allow the Uzbeks to, to uh, proceed as they see fit. As for their knowledge of uh, economic uh, practices in the West, le let us uh, remember that this is a Central Asian society, Turkic speaking, with closer ties to the Islamic world. And again, uh, what is good for America or what is good for Western Europe may not necessarily be good for a uh, society in which there are um, different economic uh, ways of behaving. In case you've just joined us, our guest is Mr. Boydan Nahilo. I'm having trouble with his name. Perhaps he can pronounce it for all of us. It's a very simple name. <laughs> it's Bohdan Nahailu. Very good. Uh, author of a new book entitled The Soviet Disunion, A History of the Nationalities Problem in the USSR. Marquette, Michigan, thanks for standing by. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Nahailu, uh, what's your nationality? My, my nationality, my background is Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Um, it's interesting. Jan Nim Nogogovoru Paruski, um, I'm curious, what, uh, it, I've always recognized that there's a uh, problem with Americans attempting to relate to Soviets because of a language problem and uh, uh, consequently or subsequently a, um, an understanding problem. And it, it appears that the same might be happening um, within the Soviet Union itself because of, as the last caller just mentioned, the difference in language and the desire for certain nationalities to speak their own. What um, specifically has the Soviet Union done with regard to language and um, imp imposing that? And um, I guess that'll be it. I'm really kind of curious about that. I'm a linguist uh, as a hobby. Okay. Uh, briefly, the Soviet government uh, promised from the outset that it would allow the free development of all languages. And indeed, there was, as I mentioned in the 20s, some attempt to meet the needs of the non-Russians. Indeed, uh, for some of the non-Russian groups, the smaller ones, who didn't even have a written language, languages were invented. But this began to take on more perverse forms, uh, in my view, by the end of the 20s, when languages, when entire groups were forced to go over from their traditional scripts to, say, either the Latin script or to the Cyrillic script, the, the script in which the Slavs write. and. Uh, uh, what happened in the 30s and 40s was that although there, uh, there was uh, schooling in the native languages, by and large, Russian became the obligatory language, and lang uh, Russian was presented as the gateway to science, the gateway to modernity. Now, the promise had been in the 20s that all languages would be equal. So, for example, for the Ukrainians or for the uh, Belarusians, or for that matter, for the Uzbeks, uh, that promise meant that they would be able to develop science in their own language, that they would be able to write about medicine and economics in that language. Most of these languages of the uh, larger groups are vibrant modern languages. They're not obsolete dying languages. But especially in the 50s and 60s and 70s, these languages were forced out of schools. They were certainly forced out of universities. It became compulsory, for instance, to submit dissertations, PhD dissertations in Russian. and. Uh, Russian, all things Russian became uh, 
the sort of the thing for non-Russians to aspire to. There was an, an implicit form of uh, uh, a racism with the Russians as the dominant a big brother nation. Um, as it's not simply the language question, though you say, uh, you know, uh, what, what has happened and ask me to explain. I should point out it's not simply the language question. That is one of the more salient aspects of this entire problem. It involves economic rights, it involves certainly political rights, and it involves the whole question of, of cultural self-determination and ultimately national self-determination. Because uh, under the guise of running a new type of multinational socialist society, Moscow fooled the world for many decades that in it, in fact, was building this kind of society. Um, uh, Paul Robeson, for example, when he went to the Soviet Union at the end of the 40s, uh, was greatly disenchanted by what he saw, by, by the anti-Semitism, by the, uh, the uh, chauvinistic attitude of many Russians towards the non-Russians. He, he was uh, completely disenchanted because he, he had believed that perhaps this was indeed some sort of new model type of society. Now, the non-Russians have known this, and increasingly, Russians themselves have begun to speak out in the last few years. Andrei Sakharov, for instance, or even Boris Yeltsin, were among the few Russians who uh, sounded uh, the alarm about this and said, you know, we've given the non-Russians a war deal, we have to take their uh, interests into account, and ultimately began to admit that the system was imperial and that it would have to be dismantled. Now what we've reached is a very curious situation when the Russians themselves are divided, certainly uh, in the last few months they've become divided, about their own uh, mission, about their own place in the Soviet Union. And for once, the Russians themselves ha have become sensitized to the existence of a massive nationality problem. Until now, they, want to, they believe that the non-Russians owed them a debt, that, uh, uh, that the Russians had somehow been responsible for raising the cultural level of all the non-Russian groups. And suddenly they had to deal with this, uh, what one uh, famous British uh, historian, uh, Hugh Seaton Watson, calls the problem of colonial ingratitude. And uh, it's only now that they're really become, coming to terms with it. I should tell you that our guest, uh, Boydan Nahailo, is also a senior research analyst with Radio Liberty in Munich. I've uh, been there since 1984. Yes. What um, is your specific duty uh, with that organization? Well, for several years I've been a senior research analyst. I've collected information on uh, what's, been, what's happening in the Soviet Union and written analyses about this. Radio Liberty doesn't simply broadcast to the Soviet Union. It is the largest research center on the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, if we take into account also Radio Free Europe, which is the sister radio station. And uh, we produce uh, analyses, reports, which the New York Times or governments, embassies, universities subscribe to. But in more recent months, I've been responsible for the Ukrainian service within Radio Liberty. Uh, that is, we broadcast every day to Soviet Ukraine with its largest non-Russian group of all the non-Russian groups uh, for two or three hours a day. And we provide them programming in their own native language. Orange, California, thanks for standing by. Go right ahead with your question or comment. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Garcia, and I haven't had a chance to read your book, but I'm going to. But what always strikes me su as a surprise is they, they never really mention Stalin's uh, purge, and you use purge, I use murder, of the millions and millions of non-Russians uh, that, uh, that he killed during his reign. And I'm wondering whether you have uh, uh, addressed yourself to that purge that took, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering whether history is going to view this man as the murderer that he really was, or is he going to be uh, left up in, uh, in some uh, form to be recognized as a, as a true leader of some kind? Well, Mr. Garcia, I think history has already passed its judgment, certainly in the Soviet Union. Uh, I think there are not that many supporters of Stalin left. Of course, there are conservatives and reactionaries that uh, will not uh, admit to supporting Stalin, but perhaps still want to perpetuate his ways. But on the whole, even in the Soviet press now, there is a fairly uh, objective picture of what went on under Stalin. 
And you're quite right to say that many millions of people lost their lives. To be fair, the, Ru the Russians suffer too. And this is one of the great paradoxes of this system, that the imperial nation uh, ended up uh, losing out because they lost out economically. They're in a, a worse situation than, than many of the non-Russians too and now have uh, an identity problem uh, as, uh, in, in this uh, imperial setup. But uh, those who suffered the most, I would uh, name, for instance, uh, the Ukrainians who lost uh, six to seven million people in the uh, artificial famine of 1932 to 33. Robert Conquest has, has published uh, a monograph on the subject, The Harvest of Sorrow. The Kazakhs, the Kazakh tribesmen who during the period of collectivization were forcibly made to go into collective farms when as, as many as a third of their entire population perished. Uh, many other groups have, have suffered a great deal. Du after World War II, there was large-scale mass deportations from the Baltic Republics, from Western Ukraine, and uh, part of the problem that we see today in the Baltic Republics and in Western Ukraine, Moldavia, results st stems from this time when hundreds of thousands of, of the indigenous population were sent in cattle trucks to Siberia and when millions of Russians were brought in. And of course today those Russians uh, who are living in these uh, western peripheral regions of the empire, uh, they are not liberals. They don't want to give up their uh, colonial status in these republics and hence we have these clashes uh, between say the Lithuanian indigenous population and the very large sizable uh, Russian minority that's uh, settled there in the last uh, 30 or so years. Bogdan uh, Nahalo is our guest. He's an author of a book on the Soviet Union. Uh, let's go back to the phones. Miami, Florida. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, good evening. <coughs> Let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, concerning uh, Germany, now the unification of Germany coming up, and with their strong economy as they have it, uh, wouldn't the Soviet Union kind of fear Germany in the sense that instead of coming there with rifles as they did in World War II, they're going to come there with uh, commerce, free market society, a weak economy in the Soviet Union, obviously opening up those free markets. Uh, West Germany could be the dominant player in Europe and very dominant in the Soviet Union if it's opened up extremely to, to the Soviet Union, I mean to uh, Germany. My reading of the situation is, is rather different. I think that the Soviet Union, and uh, we simplify or generalize when we say Soviet Union, let's say the people who make decisions in Moscow, the Kremlin is, is very interested in getting uh, German credits and German technical know-how and all sorts of aid right now. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why uh, Moscow has been uh, softening its entire approach on the German reunification issue. Certainly in the western borderlands of the Soviet Union, I've just returned from a trip to the Soviet Union a week and a half ago, there's a great deal of hope that perhaps uh, it will not only be Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia that will get western aid, but also s at least the western uh, republics, the Baltic republics, Ukraine, Moldavia. I would want to uh, stress another uh, issue though that is perhaps sometimes forgotten, and that is uh, Germany at least has gone through the, uh, has been forced onto the path of democratization and denazification. It's a very different society today from that which existed 50 years ago. It's this, this process is, as we see, a much more difficult one in the Soviet Union. And uh, the process of de-Stalinization has not gone quite as far as denazification went in, uh, the, uh, in Germany. And the problem is this, that the two Germanys combined have a population today of about 77 million. <coughs> but we should remember that the Russians alone, without the non-Russians, have almost double this population. This is a very large nation with uh, imperial aspirations and imperial tradition and a need uh, for Lebensraum. And indeed, they have treated the outlying re regions of the empire, which in fact uh, are, are countries waiting to, to have their own uh, statehood, independent statehood, as uh, areas for expansion, for economic exploitation, and in effect for Lebensraum, living space. Seattle, Washington, go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I come from a Lithuanian background, and um, my mother was born there, and she has a lot of stories that she tells um, of what happened during the war and shortly after the war. Um, my comment to you is that um, I'll, in, during history, most of the imperial countries who conquered uh, 
other, other countries were usually thought of by those countries as having a superior culture and having, um, you know, greater economic advantages. And most of the non-Russian nationalities don't see Russia in that sense. You know, they see it as, as almost a backward country and having a backward culture. And I don't think that they've ever really um, looked to them the way that they do to, or the way that other countries have always looked to, to um, an imperial, imperial conqueror. Um, I'm curious as to what you think will happen to Lithuania and to the Baltic states now that uh, Lithuania has suspended its declaration of independence and uh, whether you think that Lithuania will be eventually independent and also some of the other Baltic or some of the other republics, uh, whether they will eventually have their freedom. Well, I, I think that uh, what we're seeing is the uh, gradual and ever faster process of imperial uh, decay and the crucial question is, will it be a process of peaceful dismantling of the empire, or will it be one of chaotic disintegration? And here, it's very important what Gorbachev chooses to do. I think the fact that Lithuania has been forced by economic pressure to yield temporarily has by no means solved the problem. It has simply thrown the ball back into Moscow's court, into Gorbachev's court, and now he has to come up with some sort of a uh, really good solution, and there are no really good solutions. The Lithuanians want out, and so do many of the other non-Russians now. Uh, Gorbachev is, is grasping for the formula of uh, somehow renewing the Soviet Federation, coming up with a new Union Treaty, something which he rejected out of hand only about six months ago. He said there was no need for a Union Treaty. It remains to be seen what the terms of this treaty are. Unless Moscow, unless Gorbachev, unless the reformists uh, offer the non-Russians a new deal and move towards a confederal type of uh, multinational uh, structure, uh, I fear that uh, whether uh, Gorbachev wants uh, to retain the integrity of the system or not, um, these changes will continue to acquiring their own dynamic and the system will continue to uh, disintegrate. So I do believe that, in, that uh, sooner or later the Baltic republics will be independent and probably some of the other republics too. Could you predict uh, how soon? It's very difficult to predict today um, because uh, we've all been taken by surprise, all analysts, all Sovietologists, by the speed and the scale of what's been happening in the Soviet Union. What is happening today could not have been predicted six months ago, a year ago, and certainly Gorbachev couldn't have predicted it. So um, we just don't know and uh, we have nothing really from the past on which to base our prognoses on. Houston, Texas, you've been standing by. Go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to address the question back to the language uh, and, and primarily the ethnic difficulties or differences in the different provinces in the um, Soviet Union. Um, I've noticed that in Texas where we now have um, Spanish uh, language on the ballot and bilingual education, that that is sort of um, a problem that can be twofold. It can certainly um, enhance the Spanish-speaking people as far as their ethnic background, but it also seems to keep them out of the mainstream of life. Yes, they can vote. Uh, yes, they can they can go to school at some level, but they can't progress into the mainstream of life, into the business part of the world. And I would like for you to speak to that with the, as regard to the Soviet Union. Well, uh, I think what we have to bear in mind is the uh, very great difference between the American situation and the Soviet. Uh, many Spanish speakers, Hispanics, and, and others, as, as they refer to here, uh, seek to come to this country for, to have a better life, for economic betterment. Uh, to escape from poverty and whatnot. It's a very different type of situation in the Soviet Union. People haven't come to the Soviet Union, they've been escaping from the Soviet Union for decades. And what has happened is that we've seen imperial conquest of entire countries. For instance, Lithuania or Ukraine or Uzbekistan didn't vote to join the Soviet Union. They didn't invite the Russians in. And these outsiders, in effect, 
came in with their own, with a different culture, with a different language, and imposed this on the uh, indigenous population and began forcing out the, uh, the local national language out of schools and out of uh, universities. So, uh, and what made it all, uh, worse was all the time you had the promise and uh, the empty promise that in fact uh, there was equality. Uh, the non-Russians were told all these years that your language is equal. Uh, of course you can uh, study in your language. And to, uh, to a certain extent that was true. But in effect, as I've stated earlier, the gateway to learning, the gateway to science, the gateway to contacts with the outside world became the pr preserve of the Russian culture, of the Russian language. Bilingualism was also promoted in the Soviet Union, but as the non-Russians consistently pointed out in the 60s, 70s and 80s, this was a one-sided bilingualism stacked heavily in favor of the Russian language, and there was a great deal of tokenism involved as regards the, the non-Russian languages and cultures. And just to give you one example, during a period of uh, cultural revival in Ukraine when the party authorities at the end of the 60s and early 70s, the local party authorities backed the cultural intelligentsia, the Ukrainians produced the first encyclopedia of cybernetics in the Soviet Union in the Ukrainian language which goes to show this is not a dying language, it's not some sort of, uh, for instance, um, without any uh, offense meant to the Welsh. It, 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 you one can't compare it to a language that perhaps doesn't have the support of the majority of the population. But uh, when a purge took place in Ukraine in 1972-73, one of the first things that the central authorities did was to, to stop the publication of uh, journals about physics, about mathematics, about economics in the Ukrainian language. Ukrainians and others, non-Russians, were then forced to rely on Russian. And all this time, the West was being, to uh, was being sold the great achievements of Russian culture, which un undoubtedly are great, but they were given this lopsided view of Pushkin, Chekhov, the Bolshoi Ballet, and for all intents and purposes, the non-Russian nations were submerged. They became obscured in, in the Western consciousness. Hence the surprise today that there is some sort of national problem in the Soviet Union. We are discussing the nationalities problem in the Soviet Union with author Bohdan Nahailo. If you have a question or comment, there's still time to get your phone call in. He is the author of a book entitled Soviet Disunion, A History of the Nationalities Problem in the USSR. Los Angeles, California, thanks for standing by. Go right ahead. Yes, I am. I'm enjoying the discussion here. I have a question to ask about uh, the Radio Free Liberty. Is it funded uh, in the same way that our uh, government funds uh, broadcast to Latin America? Is it funded by the United States? Secondly, can you tell me a little bit about Ukraine, their, their religion? Were they formerly Catholics? And are you a Catholic or are you Jewish? Okay, first and foremost, uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, they are funded by the American Congress. There's a board for international broadcasting which supervises the work of these radios, which are formerly a uh, private uh, corporation, uh, but they are tied into the government by the link uh, to Congress. Uh, and uh, unlike the Voice of America, which uh, exists primarily to project American values and uh, the American message, as it were, to, uh, to non-Americans. The, uh, the main task of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty is to act as a kind of surrogate domestic service for those peoples who do not have a free press as yet. Uh, so that in our broadcasts we have news on the hour, uh, we have cultural programs, we have programs about uh, history, the sorts of things that uh, people can't readily hear or find out about in their own uh, countries or their own republics, even now at a time of Glasnost. Uh, as far as the Ukrainians are concerned, they're a Slavic people, as I've said. Uh, traditionally, four-fifths of them are uh, Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Christian, and uh, one of the great uh, um, sufferings of, of this people was that their national churches were suppressed and, uh, by the Soviets, and only now in the last few months are we seeing a great renaissance of uh, the Ukrainian national churches, the largest of which was the Orthodox Church, separate from Moscow, and one-fifth were uh, Catholics in Western Ukraine. I myself am from a Ukrainian background, I'm not Jewish, and uh, uh, my family is split down the middle. My father is from a Catholic background, my mother is from a Ukrainian Orthodox background. 
I wanted to ask about uh, the so-called national contract. A good deal of your book takes a look at the history of the national contract. Could you tell our audience what that is and what its implication is in terms of what's going on now in the Soviet Union? This was uh, a way I devised of trying to bring home the idea that what we have at stake today are not simply groups of extremists, of nationalists screaming for this or that or fighting with one another. What we have are nations in some cases very large nations, demanding the very rights that Lenin and the Bolsheviks promised them. This implicit national contract, which was drawn up in the early 1920s as a precondition for the trust and loyalty of the non-Russians. And every time that there has been a relaxation of controls, the non-Russians have invoked this implicit national contract, have demanded that the proclaimed rights that they are supposed to enjoy be respected. Until about two or three years ago, uh, the non-Russians uh, limited all this to the cultural sphere because it was very difficult to start speaking about political rights. But since about two or three years ago, uh, the talk has been about the restoration of full sovereignty and now increasingly about independence, about uh, uh, the failure and bankruptcy of the system and hence uh, uh, the desire to get out of the system. Redding, California. Nice to hear from you. Go ahead. Yes, I'm enjoying this immensely. Uh, I've recently read an article about the uh, resurgence of the uh, monarchist party in the uh, Russian Republic, and I was curious. Their goal seems to be to, seems to be to bring back the czar. Uh, it's rather far-fetched, but what do you think your chances are something like this? Well, that's a very good question uh, because it points to an, a, a major aspect of the national problem, and that is the Russian problem within the Soviet Union. As I've stated earlier, the, Russian themsel uh, the Russians themselves are now asking uh, themselves, uh, where are we to go? What is our role in this system? Are we to remain the dominant group? Are we to equate uh, loyalty to the state with loyalty to the boundaries of a great Russia? And, uh, of course, there is a fairly s significant force that wants to rely on old Russian traditions, on the monarchy, on old imperial values. Uh, perhaps the most, uh, in my view, reprehensible form of this is the Pamyat organ organization, which is very chauvinistic, very anti-Semitic, very intolerant of other non-Russian groups. Uh, there are, of course, more liberal uh, expressions of Russian nationalism, but until now it's been very unclear whether, uh, they rep whether this uh, tendency represents uh, uh, a sizable uh, following. Uh, it seems, or traditionally it's been the case, that the Russian imperial mentality has had the upper hand. It's only recently that people like Sakharov, Yuri Afanasyev, Boris Yeltsin and others have, uh, have, shall we say, developed a more liberal form of, of Russian patriotism and Russian nationalism, one which is pro-Western and which is tolerant of the non-Russians. What has happened now is that we've seen in the last few months the Russians themselves actually asserting their own rights, and as you know, under the leadership of Boris Yeltsin in the Russian Federation, the Russians have gone ahead and proclaimed their own sovereignty. What this is going to mean in practice still remains to be seen, because Boris Yeltsin is on record as uh, supporting the aspirations and the political demands of the non-Russians and yet now increasingly he'll have to as a shrewd politician harness this this uh, exploding Russian patriotism and uh, deal with the question of what shape and what size Russia and the Soviet Union is going to be in the future. Galveston, Texas, you're the final caller. Go right ahead. Mr. Nahalo, for years I've been hearing that uh, the Jews have been discriminated against in the Soviet Union, when actually in reality they were the backbone of the Bolshevik Revolution. And in my contact with many of them here in the United States as immigrants, I found out that actually they were well-to-do, consequently they had, relatively speaking, they had better standard of living than average Russians. Now, one we don't hear about actually that really being discriminated against has been the Muslims in the Soviet Union. And there are over 50 million of them or what, whatever. And just to give you one example, right now we are in the middle of the pilgrimage to Mecca, where there are about three to four million Muslims right now from all around the world uh, visiting or making their pilgrimage to Mecca. And that is a requirement for every Muslim for once in their life to make that pilgrimage. And I'm not aware of really any Muslims ever being permitted from the Soviet Union to make it to this, to the Holy Mecca, 
And unless maybe a few of them, you know, slip through the borders through Iran, maybe through Afghanistan, and I'd like to have your opinion on that. Well, let's start with the first part briefly. Uh, I think that it's uh, not accurate to say that the Jews have not been discriminated against. There has been a great deal of anti-Semitism, in some cases uh, barely concealed official anti-Semitism. And, uh, of course, those Jews who threw their lot in with the Soviet system in the 20s and 30s did well and suffered during the purges along with others. But certainly after 1946, 1947, the Jews did become a target of anti-Semitism, which uh, was stoked up from time to time by the authorities. And this is a serious problem, and hence uh, we've seen this major uh, push by the Jews in the 70s for emigration. But I quite agree with you that uh, the Muslim problem, the Islamic problem, has been uh, overlooked in the West uh, the, because primarily the, uh, the traditionally Muslim peoples have not had a ver very good spokesman, they've not had a strong lobbies in the West, and their case has not really been presented uh, uh, as well as some of the other groups have managed to present their cases. And these people uh, in the uh, Soviet Central Asia are now beginning to come into their own. They have demographic uh, factors on their side. They have a very high rate uh, of uh, population growth, uh, which far exceeds that of the Russians or the Ukrainians and others. Um, they are increasingly becoming a major factor. They are also retrieving their cultural and religious background. Until now, only um, selected individuals uh, have been allowed to go to Mecca for pilgrimages to show that, uh, that, that uh, Muslims are not discriminated against. But there is a great deal of pressure now uh, which is forcing the, the Moscow to uh, review its policy towards Islam. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. I want to thank you very much for being our guest. We've been visiting with Boydan Nahailo, author of a new book entitled Soviet Disunion, A History of the Nationalities Problem in the USSR. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much for your calls, and stay tuned for our next discussion. See you then. Join us Thursday morning at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time for a live viewer call-in program. Our guest to take your calls will be Nancy Traver of Time Magazine. She will join us to discuss her recent book about the Soviet Union, which looks at the dreams of Soviet youth.